on YouTube. First time. Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. And welcome again to our, uh, to another Coast Digital Floor of the Philippines Zoominar. We are honored today to have with us um, Zerilyn Meneses uh, to talk about her work on orchid conservation. Um, just a few reminders um, for people on Zoom, uh, please turn off your mic and your video during the presentation. Um, if you have questions, you can put them on the chat box on, or you can, um, you can also um, indicate that you want to speak up and um, say your question. And for those people on YouTube, uh, we don't have a live stream on Facebook. So this is the first time that we are live streaming it on YouTube because my Zoom account um, is not connected with Facebook yet. Mm -hmm. So if you have questions there on YouTube, I will be there to um, um, collate your questions that you can post on the comment section. Okay, so we are going to move on to our speaker for today. So um, I will introduce Ze, and then um, she can start the lecture after my introduction. Okay, so our speaker for this afternoon is Zerilyn Meneses. She is a graduate of Bachelor of Science in Forestry, major in Forest Biological Sciences at the College of Forestry and Natural Resources, University of the Philippines, Los Banos. She earned uh, her Master of Science in Forestry uh, in 2016 uh, from the Graduate School of the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. Currently, Zerilyn is affiliated with the Environmental Biology Division of the Institute of Biological Sciences at the University of the Philippines, Los Banos. And she is involved in research projects in collaboration with the National Institute of Biological Resources, Ministry of Environment, um, Korea, uh, Department of Science and Technology Conserve, Kaigangan Program, and the Rufford Foundation's Conservation Initiative for the Orchids of Samar and of Summer Island. Yeah, sorry about that. Okay, so without further ado, uh, help me welcome um, Zerilyn Meneses to talk about um, orchid conservation. Hey, good afternoon po. Thank you, Sir Jasper. Audible po, no? Yes, yes. Okay, Loud so good. good afternoon, everyone. Today, I'll be talking about orchids in general and we will zoom in later to the orchids of Summer Island in one of my study sites. Okay, so here is a brief outline of my presentation. So we will go through a short background of the orchid family, and then we will jump to the different values attributed to orchids, and before finally zooming into summer orchids and the different threats and current trends in Philippine orchids which hopefully towards the end of the presentation discussion will give us insights in moving forward to conservation. Okay, so as a brief background, Orchidaceae is among the largest families in flowering plants with about 25 to 26,000 species worldwide distributed in 736 genera following Chase et al. 2015. So the type genus for Orchidaceae is Orchis, which is derived from the ancient Greek word, which literally translates to testicle. So yung Orchis literally translates to testicle, um, coming from the shape of the twin tuberoids of the type specimen. So for orchid distribution, um, they are nearly cosmopolitan and can be found distributed from up, uh, sea, le sea level up to alpine regions. So when looking at the distribution of orchids, before there is this theory of long distance dispersal. However, um, as studies progress, um, they found out that due to the non and non and this endospermous nature of the orchid seeds, long distance dispersal is not usually readily um, applicable. And therefore there is also this 
theory that the orchids reach this cosmopolitan or nearly cosmopolitan distribution by riding the, the then moving continents or islands. Okay. So these are the basic defining characters of orchidaceae. So it has an outer world of sepals so this one, outer world of sepal, composed of three sepals, and then an inner world of petal, and one which is highly modified, which is commonly known as the leaf or the labellum. And then the gynoecium and androecium of orchids are fused, which together forms the column. Okay. And then in this photo, you nectar spur, um, orchids are said to be masters of deceit. Why? Because sometimes uh, or most of the times they present themselves as having nectarine rewards to pollinators. But however, they just have this nectar spur um, that, mimics a ne that mimics to have a nectarine reward. But specifically, it functions so that the insect will land there, look for the nectarine reward, where actually the orchid is benefited at wala talagang nectarine reward. Okay, so this one. Uh, this is actually the sample of orchid seeds. Ito sa upper left corner of the PowerPoint. And then the photos below show the protoform. So in the five subfamilies of orchids, the presence or the presence of the protoform as yung unang nagdigermini or uh, unang structure that arises from the orchid seed is what actually binds the orchid family. So at the moment, five subfamilies are recognized in the 2015 revision by Chase and colleagues. So we have Apostasioidae, Vanilloidae, Cypripidioidae, Orchidioidae, and Epidendroidae. So the photos here shows the Philippine, some of the Philippine representatives for each of the subfamilies in Orchidaceae. So there we have Apostasia wallichiae, and then Vanilla, Vanilla rabiae. We have for Cypripidioidae, Paphiopedilum, Ampholiae, and then Habenaria, and then Drobium dilie. Okay, so let's now look at the orchids of the Philippines. So with the rapidly uh, high turnover of new Philippine orchids being described yearly, so there are around 1,314 Philippine orchid species distributed in 150 genera. But these 1,314 species at the moment are increasing each year. So with the advent of um, more research, uh, more field works, and more studies that are dwelling on orchids. And of this number, 80% or more are known to be endemic in the Philippines. So we have here, and these endemic orchids are actually most of the time listed as being threatened. So we have here samples, Vanda Luzonica, an endangered one, Grammatophilum ravani, and Vanda Sanderiana. Okay, so these photos are not mine. So now let's look at the values or economic significance of orchids. So when we talk about orchids, most of us um, right away, what comes to mind is its value in horticulture, in hybridization. So the, uh, it is the first one that will come to mind. We have Epigenium precarianum readily being traded, um, the hybrid Vandas, Phalaenopsis, Dendrobiums, and Symbidium. So there is va high value in horticulture for the orchids. But aside from that, um, in other parts of the world, Orchids are also valued as food. So this one, Orchis mascula, this is not available in the Philippines, but in some other areas. So this is a source of flour, yung kanyang tuber, and it is being converted into salep. So I'm not promoting Nestle and this other brand, but these are just example of the commercially produced salep from orchid tubers. Okay. Another is its value as food. 
So the genus Gastroja, known as the potato orchid, um, its tubers or tuberoids are valued as um, a staple food, especially in uh, the native Australian people. And your favorite ice cream. So, sino dito ang mahilig sa vanilla ice cream? So, the vanillin, which is derived from vanilla planifolia and some other representative from vanilloidae, is actually derived from the fruit of the orchids. So, vanilla planifolia is among uh, the most economically valuable orchid when it comes to food because it is being used worldwide. And it is also reported uh, that vanilla planifolia is among the most sustainably used when it comes to uh, food preparation. So, because the vanilla planifolia fruit are not just harvested from the wild, but rather it is widely cultivated and then yung kinukultivate ang dina dry and extracted for the vanillin. So aside from that, perfumery. So orchid are also values yung essential oils niya for perfume, lotion, body wash. Okay, and in traditional medicine, so we have here Gastroja elata. And it is being widely used in Chinese traditional medicine. It is said to cure uh, epilepsy, um, dizziness, headache, and stomach ache. So they are using this one. And there are some cases reported where in areas occupied by areas that are known to be occupied by Gastroja elata are now is scarce of this species due to uh, illegal poaching or harvesting from the wild of this species. So aside from those, we also have social cultural or cultural symbolism for orchids. So these four um, orchids so, and one which is a hybrid are actually known as uh, national flower or national trademark of this country. So we have Cattleya trinae for Colombia. And this Cattleya trinae is actually also being used in perfumery. Papilin natin Miss Joaquim as a national flower in Singapore, but this one is a hybrid. And then Cattleya moisi in Venezuela and Guariante skenery in Costa Rica. So in the Philippines, if you are familiar, there is this house bill proposing Vanda Sanderiana, yung ating waling-waling, uh, they are proposing in and pushing it to be a national trademark, a national flower, uh, mainly because Vanda Sanderiana is endemic to the country. Um, however, uh, so far, it's still a house bill, I think. Now, aside from those values, we also have evolutionary and ecological significance of orchid. So this photo by Wasserthal is one of the first documented actual pollination of the Darwin's orchid or Angraceum ciscepedale by the this hawkmoth was um, Santofan Morgani Predicta. So actually there is a very interesting story behind this. Um, the Darwin's orchid was first discovered, uh, is discovered 100 years earlier than its pollinator. So when Darwin, when, well, when, this, when this orchid was first found, so it was hypothesized back then that there must be a, pollina a pollinator, an insect most likely, that is specifically have this long proboscis that can... Um, capture the seemingly nectarine reward in the very long spur of the angres, of the angres, angrecum scapedale. And then afterwards, later on, um, sakalang nakita yung Santa Fan Morgani Predicta or the hawk moth as exactly the pollinator of this Darwin's orchid. So in literatures, um, they said that when this type of orchids become extinct and when the pollinator is a generalist, so there will not be very much 
implication or hazardous implication to the orchid if or, or to the pollinator if it is a generalist however if the pollinator of a particular orchid or a particular plant is a specialist or has or has co-evolved with the species then the extinction of this plant could also translate to the ex extinction of its pollinator that has co-evolved with it. So those are one of the evolutionary significance of these orchids. Okay, another one, we have Ophrys speculum. So the genus Ophrys is very well known in its mimicry and deceit. So in fact, Ophrys apifera, um, another species, resembles um, the bees. And then in this specific species of Pris speculum in the Mediterranean area, it is being exclusively pollinated by the Siscolia ciliata. So this orchid co-evolved and is strictly pollinated by just one species or just a single species of wasp. Okay, now let's proceed with the conservation values. Since orchids are uh, very um, highly dependent on its um, current ecosystem or habitat, in most areas they are being used as flagship species for conservation. Since at some point they can also be an indicator of forest disturbance in such a way that when a forest is highly disturbed, easily accessible, secondary um, trends are, or tendencies are uh, very minimal or very less diverse, very low diversity ang orchids. So they can be an indicator of the disturbance. And so conserving these orchids or making these um, orchids as flagship species can also prompt for the conservation of not just one specific species, but rather a range of habitat or a range of ecosystem. Okay, now I would like to zoom in into some of the preliminary initial results in the study in Summer Island Natural Park. So since we are talking about the conservation values of orchids, so I would like to share this one. Now, when we want to study a specific group of organism, may, may it be plant or animal, so there are certain protocols that we need to follow. So for this specific study, so we actually acquired four gratuitous permit and the permit to conduct the study and collection of the specimen. So first we met with the PO and then the LGU and presented yung aming study and then with the DNR region eight for the acquisition of gratuitous permit. Afterwards, about six, eight months of presentation and leveling off, uh, we finally got the permit. And so we proceeded with the reconnaissance and selection of study sites in Samar. So among the sites selected, uh, among the sites visited were Taft near the Forest Philippine Eagle Sanctuary, and then in Balangniga, in Marabut, in Paranas. Um, we even went inwards dun sa interior ng Summer Island in San Jose de Buwan. The first, uh, the top photos, both left and right, are both photos of Mount Hurao in San Jose de Buwan. And then this one is in Cansulabao, Paranas, yung photo sa lower left. And the lower right photo is one of the supposed study site, which is in Salcedo, um, but at during that time, ang nadat na namin ay um, yung bagong burn na area and an abandoned, they said it's an abandoned mining site. Okay, so for the sampling in the selected sites, we actually selected Sano sa Dibuan, para, uh, selected Sano sa Dibuan, Paranas, and Balangiga. So the purpose is to identify 
an area that has an edge or an interface between the forest and another echo, another area that is disturbed. And then we, there is a pre-identified point from the edge of the forest up to 800 meters inwards towards the interior of the forest. And sampling is done every 100 meters from the edge. Okay. So for the orchid collection, for this study, we actually sampled both terrestrial and epiphytic orchids. So for the terrestrial orchids, so medyo madali lang siya. Kasi what can be found in the 20 by 20 plots in every 100 meters are accounted. And, but for the epiphytic orchids, uh, we actually, actually hired a climber and we sampled up to 10 meters na height ng canopy. So this photo shows some of the orchid collection sampling. And then kapag mas mababa, we also use poles and then standard zoom lens to verify first if there is really um, orchid population in the tree. And then after getting the abundance diversity uh, data for each of the plots, I also um, analyzed the canopy openness or canopy gap from the edge towards the interior. So using gap light analyzer, um, hemispherical photograph was taken 1.5 meters from the ground and then skywards. And these were subjected to GLA 2.0. So basically, um, uh, it is very obvious in these photos that the denser the the denser the canopy or the denser the vegetation and then it translates that lesser um solar radiation or lesser light reaches the forest floor so as represented by these two types so here this is a hemispherical photograph of a uh, dense canopy and this is a hemispherical photograph of a vegetation that is quite uh, not so dense and this is the method for the data analysis. Okay, so now let's go to the results. So this is the result of the 2016 survey, um, but currently um, this will be updated soon as we input some more data based on the recent field works. So ito, as of 2016 survey, there are 100 two species of orchids in 50 genera in Samar Island alone. And 33 are new island records, 51 are endemic species, and 14 species are listed under the DAO 2017-11 or our national threatened list for the Philippines. Okay, so here are some of the significant finds or the uh, this represents the orchid diversity in the area. We have here Teroceras philippinense, endemic Philippine orchid, Tricoglutis loheriana, and Appendicula ondulata, variety longi calcarata. So, Appendicula ondulata, variety longi calcarata is actually just found again during the 2016 survey. So, it is just first known in just the type specimen. Tapos, it was not seen in the wild until ulit for about 50 something years until this survey. Okay. So we have here Abdominea minimiflora and among the significant outcomes of the 2014 to 2016 study in Samar is a description of the new Samar endemic, Philippine endemic orchid, Shuderia samarana. Okay. So we also have Phaeus tancrevillae, Dendrobium diriae, Recoglutis geminata, Nubija veratrifolia. This is among the, uh, this belongs to the Apostasioidae. And then these are two Philippine endemic orchids, Rubicesha pantherina and Rubicesha solichana. Um, Rubicesha solichana was then described under a different genus, Samarorchis. So it is known as Samarorchis solichana before, but now it is lumped in Rubicesha, uh, uh, but still a Philippine endemic orchid. 
we have Bulbophilum macoyanum and Grammatophilum wallisii. So side story for Grammatophilum, um, not necessarily Grammatophilum wallisii, but if you watch the Birds of Prey by the Cornell University, um, hanapin ninyo one of the nests noong Philippine eagle in that video is actually a very dense clump of Grammatophilum. Here are some more orchids that was found in Summer Island. Tricoglutis gibertii, Crepidium ramosii, our jewel orchid, and an interesting appendicula species. So I wasn't able to identify it yet up to the species level. Interesting species. Eulophia pulcra, Dipodium febrelii. And here species which we hope to recollect and study further. This yellow bulbophilum, this tricoglutis, which resembles tricoglutis augustanensis, and a very interestingly looking plopoglutis in San Jose Dibuan. So I will go through this very rapidly for the preliminary ecological findings. So this just shows that Abundance and orchid diversity in general for the sampled plots has a significant or is significantly affected by the distance from the edge. Okay. And so uh, this partial result shows that there is an increasing diversity and abundance of the orchids, both epiphytic and terrestrial, from the edge and then going further up to the 800 meters that was sampled in the area. And it also shows a tendency to be negatively affected by NDVI or the greenness of the vegetation. Okay, so at the local level, so local trends, so there are actually two transects with eight sampling plots per municipality. So we have two for Balangiga, two for Paranas, and two for San Jose de Buwan. And local trends also shows that as we move from the edge towards the interior, there is indeed an increasing diversity and abundance in the sampled orchids. And also, um, with a decrease in canopy openness, there is also an increasing trend in the abundance and diversity of orchids. So here are some of the edges or disturbances that forms the edges for the three sampling sites. In San Jose de Buwan, so it is observable na yung farmlands and kaingin create forest edges. Kindly uh, take a look at the photo in the upper right corner. That is actually the uh, forest boundary, yung transition between yung agro-ecosystem, yung cattle farming nila, saka yung tinanim nilang coconut area, papunta doon sa um, more pristine and intact vegetation in Mount Horao in San Jose Dibuan. In Paranas, there are patches of coconut farming and kaingin, and in Balangiga, so they have small scale mining and even diverting the, the river that transects the sampling site. And we observe carabao lagging in the area, which could be sources of the edges for the sampling sites. So this one just shows that the epiphytic orchids also follows the general trend for both the epiphyte and ter uh, terrestrial orchids when it comes to abundance, diversity, and its relationship with the edge. Okay, so for the mantles test, so this only shows that um, epiphytic orchids have a significant relationship with the total solar radiation. So the higher the amount of light in the area, there is a tendency that there is a higher amount or higher diversity for epiphytic orchid. Um, and it is its abundance, however, is negatively influenced by the slope. So, sabihin, the more sloping the area, um, the lesser epiphytic orchids are found. So why? Um, it can 
it could be that because epiphytic orchids are highly dependent on its photophyte. When we talk about photophyte, these are plants, trees, palms, um, other um, sturdy plants, which the orchids anchors to. So when you have a steeper slope, actually, the tendency is to have lesser trees, lesser standing plants, so lesser vegetation na pwedeng kapitan ng epiphytic orchids. Yeah. And for the terrestrial orchids, so the there is a positive relationship between diversity and elevation. So terrestrial orchids for the sampling sites tend to increase in diversity with increasing elevation. Okay. Now, from the study, these are some of the threatened orchids of Summer Island. So we have Aridis liana, vulnerable Arachnis flosaris, or the spider orchid, classified as endangered under the NR 2017-11. Bulbophilum cumingiae and Bulbophilum loherianum endangered. Symbidium aliciae, this is an endemic terrestrial orchid in the Philippines and classified as endangered also. Epigenium tricarianum, considered as vulnerable. Um, this one, Epigenium tricarianum, a very popular among collectors, actually. Germatophilum multiflorum, variety tigrinum, vulnerable. Paphiopedilum cellulare, the hairy, the hairy sleeper orchid. This, this is considered as critically endangered. Gramatophilum wallisii, critically endangered, and Phalaenopsis ludemeniana. Now I would like to go to the threats to Philippine orchids. So these are just some of the common threats. The photo, the topmost photo actually shows um, an abandoned mining area, and then afterwards. This actually photo is taken after the Yolanda. Eh. Um, nag dry up yung area after ng Yolanda, maraming broken branches. Tapos, after being abandoned, it was consummated by fire, leaving the area that way, the site that way. So, probably consuming, probably the orchids that could have been there were also consumed or na nawala with the change in the vegetation. And then here in the lower left um, photo, that is in Northern Philippines, we have change in land use. So what is supposed to be a moist um, upper mountain forest is now a vegetable garden, vegetable area. And then another is kainin and harvesting, illegal harvesting of trees. So sabi natin kanina, epiphytic orchids are highly dependent on their photophytes. And so what happens when these large trees are extracted from the forest, when kainin was unsustainably applied in the area. So we lose those photophytes, we lose those trees, translating also to the losses in the abundance and diversity of the orchids occupying the area. So current threats to Philippine orchids, with the advent of the continuing and prolonged uh, lockdown, a lot of people are turning into collecting plants and taking care of plants in their homes. But then, so again, sunod-sunod, that the DNR from different regions, the BMB, the central office, has been issuing um, these reminders that uh, uh, these highly threatened and the endemic um, endangered plants that are illegally being collected to supply some of the ongoing and increasing demand during this current lockdown. So, nandiyan na yung mga news na yung, the social media, e-commerce, somehow facilitates illegal orchid trades. So, there are illegal plant trades happening. And one of the plants or one of these plants which are illegally traded during these times 
is this endemic and highly threatened orchids in the Philippines. So beware, plantitos and plantitas. Um, hopefully, when you try to acquire plants, it is not the threatened, uh, uh, listed as threatened under the DNR memo. Okay, so here are some more threatened orchids in the Philippines, which are also commercially traded. I don't know, maybe both legally and illegally. So we have a Michela Monticola listed as critically endangered. Wilbophilum facetum, endangered. Phalaenopsis istuarsiana. Vandala melata, Dendrobium bolenyanum. We have this uh, fire orchid, Renantera philippinensis, Symbidium alishiei, uh, Silogaine palawanensis, Dendrobium nemorale, Vandopsis lisichiloides. Ah, sorry, so that's that, those are some of the threatened um, orchids in the Philippines. So now, with all of these um, on, ongoing threats and all of these known values of orchids, aside from just the commercial value, what can we do to move forward towards conservation? So... These actually are clips, photos from the initiatives done in Samar Island Natural Park. So we started, um, dahil sa laki ng area, the, the initiative was focused first in Paranas, uh, near the Samar Island Natural Park headquarters. So we actually tied up with a local people's organization. So we introduced to them, um, ano ba yung orchids? Um, why are they threatened? What can we do? Should we collect these or not? So what, what could be the management strategies that can be done? So are we just gonna, uh, when we see an orchid, iiwan mo lang ba siyan? Or is there a certain scheme that can be done to make use of these orchids? So what can we do to move forward towards sustainably using these threatened species or what can we do to move forward also into conserving these highly threatened endemic orchids in the Philippines. So key takeaway, sabi nga ni Baba Dayong, in the end, we will only conserve what we love. We will love what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught. So it is good to know that we have this, that they are endemic, they are threatened, and they are affected, um, could be negatively by the actions that we do. And so there must be something that we should do towards them. So I would like to thank the following, the Ruford Foundation for the funding of the conservation initiative, the OSTSEI, Summer Island Natural Park, Tambi and Region 8 for granting us the permit to do the study and collection of the sample species. So, JT Adorador, my fiancé, and the fieldwork Kuyas of Summer Island who has been helping us since 2014, 2015, sa pabalik-balik sa Samar, and my academic advisory committee, um, Professor Malabrigo, Dr. Buot, and Professor Tinya. So here are some of my references. That's all. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Zé. Um, if you could stop sharing, yeah, that's wonderful. Okay. Yeah, so we, uh, at this point, we are moving um, on to the question and answer. So I'll begin with uh, a question from the YouTube and then Okay. We will have a question from Zoom as well with Abby. So um, I forgot to introduce to you my co-moderator for today. For this afternoon is Abby Gil Garina. Hello. Say hi. Good afternoon. <laughs> okay, so let's have the first question um, on YouTube. Um, so it says here, um, ma'am, can we consider air quality as one factor affecting growth and development of orchids? Okay. 
um, air quality. Um, there, we basically know the trend that um, ano ba? for these specific sites kasi, um, we did not account, I did not account for the air quality. Um, however, orchids are respondent to a lot of environmental factors and sometimes their ability to, to thrive, to survive in the area is not just dependent on one factor. So air quality um, could be among the factors that can in one way or another affect it. Um, but um, mind you, I think the establishment of orchids and based on literatures also, it's successful relationship with mycorrhizal fungi actually determines a lot from its germination in the wild up to its establishment. And ayun, um, they are more responsive actually to abrupt changes in light conditions, um, drought conditions, as and such. But again, it, it could be among the factors that can be considered. Right. So what could be the possible effect of like air quality on orchid? Like it would it affect the development or um, flowering or most uh, most likely it's it's success of establishment in a certain area. Because um um it's not uh pwede kasi siyang hindi directly related. Um the uh, for example the more polluted the the environment or the air quality, then it can translate uh, um, to differences in the, uh, uh, it can affect the rate of the relationship or your establishment inoculation for, of the mycorrhizal fungi that is actually directly affecting the establishment and growth of the orchid as compared to um, good air quality, something like that. Right. Abby? Yeah, thank you. So for our next question, galing to kay uh, Dr. Susan Aquino Ong. So you presented Zed, a lot of beautiful orchids and we know that one of them, the factors kung bakit sila pinopoach ay dahil maganda sila. So for Dr. Ong, um, she wanted to know what makes this particular species uh, G. multiflorum variety tigrinum popular to plant collectors. Mm. Oh, kento. Um based on interviews, uh, from from my study, uh, based on interviews and on you know, people have this tendency to value what is rare. Okay. And so um because they they put higher value or well, price, kapag mas rare yung isang species, being a collector's item. And so, being rare, kaya nagiging attract, uh, nakaka-attract din siya. It attracts yung buyers, poachers of this species, of these orchids. And dahil rare siya, they can, uh, they can put higher price on this specific species. And so, kapag the rarer the species, uh, higher price, so it it translates agad sa higher income for illegal collect or for illegal poachers, illegal collectors. Ayun po. Right. Although I would like to stress that um, that not all orchid sellers are actually illegal, because um, there are guidelines also from the NR um, is na nag specify It specifies actually that you can have a mother plant and then you reproduce it. Para mihin mo siya mass propagation. And then afterwards, you can actually legally sell those. Yung mga nursery grown mass propagated orchids. So my permit for that. So not all orchids that are being sold are actually illegal. Hindi naman po. So as long as it has the necessary permit, um, it is um, it undergoes undergone the protocol. So sold legally naman po yung mga yan. So is it a good idea, like when you buy an orchid from a store, you ask the store owner if you can if they can show you a certification that you are selling the orchids legally? Hmm. Actually, that is one good point. I know. Um, Pero um, here's a tip. Actually, at a glance, you can see when an orchid is 
has been established in a nursery or is just um, collected. collected from the wild. Because I will not drop a name, but I've been to a lot of garden show also. Tapos you can you can clearly see eh, which among the plants yung kasama pa yung branch na pinutol. There, there are those cases. Uh, kasama pa yung branch na pinutol and then when the garden show runs from 5 to 10 days towards the end of the garden show, in some cases you can see yung mga just um, freshly harvested from the wild um, hindi nakakapit doon sa sa kanyang, uh, what do you call this? Doon sa islab, kung saan siya nakalagay, and then the leaves are wilting. So, at a glance, you can actually, for yourself, you can see if these plants are actually established or is freshly harvested or collected from the wild. So, any any legal, kapag siya ay isang legally sourced or legally sold na halaman or orchid, then you must see to it, oh, so bakit kasama pa yung freshly cut na branch? Bakit okay. after after a week of the show, eh, natutuyo na siya kasi hindi pa pala siya established? So you, you would know at a glance. Right. Okay, here, uh, there's a question about um, intervention. Mm -hmm. So what sustainable interventions can we introduce to the locals of Summer Island or how can we collaborate with them to reduce poaching of these orchids and encourage their preservation of biodiversity? So for so, example, mm -hmm. uh, an NGO in the Union pays locals to surrender turtle eggs to, to egg nurseries instead of selling them for food in the market. Mm -hmm. Okay, so can, can, I, can I cite what was done in Samar, or yeah. at least for the study site. Yeah, sure. Okay, so for for this specific study, um, what was done actually was, yung first phase, there was intensive um, seminar workshop. So what are orchids? Why are, they, why are they threatened? What are the orchids of Samar Island? What is the significance of having these orchids? What is the significance of conserving these orchids in the area? So there are several uh, seminar workshops with the local people at the onset of the project. And then um, you can actually see the improvement eh, from yung mga unang punta in 2014, papunta doon sa latter part ng project. Na, na sometimes consciously they would say, oh, ano yan, uh, that is fire orchid, di ba? Um, threatened yan, Philippine endemic yan, something like that. And then quite recently, in a presentation with the PAMBI, um, um, they said that the conservation initiative in Samar, uh, they are actually using stud recent studies and conservation initiatives since they are pushing for the, uh, I think, heritage site recognition of the Samar Island. So, yung isang ginawa doon for the Ruford project is to ex establish a nursery which aims to um, uh, serve as a repository of the orchids na fallen from the lag. Kasi even it's a natural park, there are people in the area. There are people occupying the area. And hindi mo na sila maitatanggal doon. Nandoon na sila even before it was declared a natural park. And there are activities, anthropogenic activities going on in the area. Now, this is small people's organization in which the project um, collaborated with. Ang ginagawa nila at the moment, when they, when they go out in the field and then doon sa mga natumbang puno or left by the kainin, yung mga remnants na nakukuha nila doon sa mga natumba, na, na orchids, yun yung dinadala nila in a local mini nursery. So the aim is that for these orchids to reestablish first in the local nursery, also in Summer Island Natural Park, and later on reintroduce these rescued orchids to the wild. So nandoon lang muna siya at the moment while they are saved after a kaingin or timber extraction. And then the aim is to eventually re reintroduce these salvage orchids to the wild. Ayan po. All right. 
Thank you for that, Zed. Um, ngayon, we have another question from Miss Irish. Um, she would like to ask if there are species of orchids that are endemic to the Philippines, and how we um are there any studies for medicinal uses? Mm. Okay, endemic orchids in the Philippines. So actually, there are many endemic orchids in the Philippines. So. Um, as was presented earlier, about 80% of the orchids in the Philippines, or well, in, in Summer Island, 80% are endemic. And in the Philippines, a number of the threatened orchids are also endemic to the country. So, napakarami po nating endemic orchids sa country. Um, but at the moment, um, um, I haven't heard of a study testing for the endemic orchids and its application to med uh, and its medicinal properties. So, wala pa. But that is an avenue that can be um, explored. So, who, that, uh, who knows, di ba? Yeah. The, sa napakadaming orchids natin. Maybe Very just good. because they value more of the aesthetic value. Mm -hmm. Kasi at the moment, yes, at the moment, um, when we talk about orchids of the Philippines, very popular siya even abroad, uh, pero the value is more placed on the horticulture side, yung aesthetics niya. The readily available monetary value translated from the orchid. So, nandoon pa tayo sa face na yon at the moment. Yeah. Sadly. <laughs> okay, there's a question here. Uh, where do you draw the line between promoting native species for landscaping slash ornamentals and collection in the wild. How can it be sustainable? Mm -hmm. Ayon. So when we talk about sustainability, um, I'd like to I'd like to cite yung example from Thailand. Diba Thailand is very known for their orchid industry. And what differentiates Thailand at the moment from Philippines is that even their Vanda Cirolea, yung blue Vanda orchid, um, even those, they make it available through mass propagation, through aseptic culture. And those are the ones that are being sold out in various sizes. Yung iba, sinosold out siya na na in a flask, and then ikaw na yung bahalang mag maglipat. Yung iba, sinosold out siya in larger in larger sizes. So what makes it sustainable is when you do not directly harvest from the wild and then outright you sell it out. You make, um, you make it sustainable when you have this mother plant, you must propagate it through a septic culture, you establish it in the nursery, and those are the ones that you sell out and not the ones directly harvested from the wild. So napakaganda actually no move to use native species in landscaping, um, introducing them also in urban areas. Um, but again, sabi ko nga, you have to be very conscious kung saan galing yung ginagamit mo. Kung saan galing yung binibili mong um, organism or halaman. As, is, as in this case, where did these orchids came from? Right. Abby? All right. So we have here another interesting question from Ms. Hazel. Um, for this one, in your opinion, what is the ethical thing to do when you see a plant being sold and it looks like it was poached, especially if we see it struggling, uh, natutuyo na siya, tapos alam natin na matatapon rin naman by the end of the day. Uh, would you buy it to, and try to save it or really refuse to support the people doing this practice? Okay. So to answer that... Um, while preparing this PowerPoint, I actually read um, some of the e schemes when it comes to things like that. So there is this one view wherein, because pwede mong sabihin na, oh, the plant is, it, it, it might just die when I did not, when I do not purchase it, kasi kinuha na siya, nandiyan na. It was already harvested, um, it is already dried out, so when I will not buy this one, it will just die, so kawawa naman yung plant. So there is that one viewpoint. But on the other hand, have you ever also think that when you buy that plant, because you think that, oh, kawawa yung plant, it will die, 
then you are actually giving the idea or the notion to that seller uh, that, ah, tinatangkilik yung ginagawa ko. So there are buyers, even if it is illegally collected. And so, someone bought it, then might as well, I will collect again and then sell again. And so, nagiging cycle siya. Okay, so now, do we want to stop that cycle na uh, tayo ay nagiging buyer ng illegally illegally traded orchids? Do, do we want to stop that? Or are we just fine joining the cycle, enabler of the cycle, since merong market for the illegally traded plants? Okay, so that is it. Yep. Thank you. Um, there's another question, um, Ze. What yes. is stopping us from mass propagating our native orchids? And what is the government role come, come in again, this? Sir? What is stopping us or preventing us from mass propagating our native orchids? And what is the government's role in this potential avenue for conservation and promotion of native species? Okay. So what's stopping us? Mass propagation and aseptic culture of orchids comes with a cost. With a cost. Hindi siya libre. Okay. And since... Um, Orchids are non-endospermous. Yung seeds niya ay non-endospermous. When you do a septic culture or when you do mass propagation of these um, species, of these orchids, um, you would need a lot of um, readily available lab-grade, uh, it could be media, nutrients, to support this mass propagation. So it comes with a cost. Okay? Kaya, um, and some people do not uh, just do not want to invest that much high cost to do mass propagation when the individual orchids when the species are readily harvested in the wild so nagkakaroon siya so will i will i do this long process of mass propagation when i can just collect so nagkakaroon ng ganon so there are laws or memorandums that are in place by the governing bodies actually so kailangan lang sigurong um, to reach more people and to educate more that there could be this protocol that can be followed instead of just actively collecting doon sa ating wild populations so that's it um how can we do that hopefully we can say Government funding, research funding for those. Um, I think DOST and other government bodies are actively funding proposals also towards conserving our biodiversity. So for interested individuals, a lot of uh, there are um, local funding bodies also and the government agencies that can fund conservation initiatives. You just have to make your proposals and you just have to have collaborations also. Mm. All right. Thank you for that, Zed. Now, uh, we have another question here from Mr. Mumin. Yep, um, I think that will be the last question for today. Yes. His question is a bit uh, technical. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so with the cosmopolitan nature of the distribution of orchids, yep. how many percent of the genus or the species from the Philippines are endemic, native, or island endemic? And or, or island endemic? Island endemic? Um, okay. Uh, ba to? Um, I haven't actually tallied because we have 1,000 plus islands in the Philippines and to account for the island endemic species. Diba? Yung, when we say island endemic, kasi, that particular species can just be found on that specific island. Yes? But we have this Philippine endemic. Um, the Philippines, uh, yung species na endemic sa Philippines as a whole, which is about 80% of the known orchids in the Philippines. About 80% are endemic to the country. And then again, this 80% is um, rising every year with the advent of uh, the discovery of more or addition of more orchids which tend to be endemic to the country. 80% or so 
around that area, ar around that percentage. Oh, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, so that um, wraps up our question and answer. And I would like to thank again Ze for um, sharing us her time to talk about a very interesting um, topic about orchid conservation. So there are some comments here on, on YouTube about um, nurseries, accredited nurseries um, of orchids. Um, they're actually poached in the wild. And mm -hmm. stuff. so I, I hope um, you, you'll be able to see this on YouTube yeah. and you'll be able to answer some of those um, controversial issues um, that we have with orchids. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, they're, they're comments actually, they're not questions, they're, they're, mm -hmm. they're comments, so that's why I did not include them. Yeah, so before we go, uh, before we uh, uh, stop the live stream on YouTube, we would like to invite everyone next week again for another Zoominar. Is it next week or two weeks from now? I'll, I'll, I'll update you, but the next Zoominar will be about Sertandra, uh, the mm -hmm. genus Sertandra. Um, is it just Naraisi, right? Is it? I forgot which family is this. Um, and uh, it will be a talk by Jay Olivar, who is a PhD student in Germany. Yeah. So thank you once again for coming here in our Zoominar. So I hope you've learned a lot. And we hope to see you again in another Zoominar uh, on Zoom and on Facebook. We'll be back, we'll be back on Facebook um, next week in, the, in, in our next Zoominar. Okay. Thank you very much. And good thank afternoon. You. Maraming salamat din. Maraming salamat po. Magaling. Congratulations. Thank you, Jasper. Thank you, Ma'am Susan. Thank you. Bye. Yeah. Hindi na pa na mag-end.